As farm system rankings are dropping across the Major League Baseball stratosphere, let's get into how good this Nationals farm system actually is and take it for yourself. How good do you think it is? You are Locked On Nationals, your daily Washington Nationals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thank you all for making Locked On Nationals your first listen every single day as we are free and available wherever you get your podcast. And of course, I'm your host, Ryan Clary. You can catch me over on Twitter at Ryan Clary 11 and as well as the show page at LO underscore Nationals. As all your latest Nationals news and notes are right there. And while you're at it, make sure to search Locked On Nationals wherever you get your podcast, including over on YouTube. Hit that subscriber button, turn on the notification bell, and do what you need to do to get your Nationals content every single day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network where it's your team every day. Later on in the show, listen, the Nationals, pitchers and catchers are reporting within the next few days at this moment in time. In my opinion, the Nats need to add a starting pitcher. We're going to kind of get into that later on in today's show. Also, Bobby Witt Jr., big-time prospect back in the day, just signed an 11-year extension with the Kansas City Royals, the biggest extension in franchise history. Let's talk about it, Nationals. You got a shortstop. He's pretty young. He's pretty good. Let's discuss that a little bit later on of today's show. But we're going to start with discussing this Nationals farm system as this has kind of been the hoopla, in my opinion, around Nationals baseball. But before we jump into it, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. So we're going to get started with today's show with just kind of jumping in to farm system rankings. Baseball America released theirs and just kind of ranking 1 through 30, the top farm systems in all of baseball. The Nationals were sitting right in the middle around 15th there in Baseball America. You check different sites. They'll kind of have different opinions of guys. They may have some guys a little bit higher than Baseball America, some a little bit lower, but ultimately this Nationals farm system is hovering around middle of the pack. Last year at this time, this Nationals farm system was probably top 10. A lot of people were a lot higher on it. You had guys like Robert Hassel that people were thinking that he could bounce back. Let's continue to be a top 100 prospect. You had Elijah Green, who was in the fold as well. All those guys right then and there, they struggled a little bit. But here's the thing with this Nationals team. And I think this is something that we can all kind of admit to. This Nationals farm system is very top heavy. It is a very top heavy system. You look at the two guys who kind of highlight the Nationals farm system. Number one, You got Dylan Cruz, the former number two overall pick back in this last year's draft. Phenomenal. Number two, James Wood. Another blue chip kind of prospect with a very high ceiling, probably the highest ceiling amongst the Nationals top prospects goes. Those are two guys right then and there that you can say, those are going to be very good baseball players in the the major leagues. They're going to be very good. You can count on them moving forward. Number three, Brady House. Again, in my opinion, someone that I think is a shoe in to be a very good major leaguer someday. I think he has the potential to be an all-star third baseman. I think he's going to potentially win a silver slugger someday. I'm very high on Brady House and what he can provide for the Nationals down the line. There's also others. It's not just those three, though. You got Robert Hassel, who, again, coming off a broken haymate bone back in 2022, which he fully broke at the Arizona Fall League, kind of rehabbing in 2023. Maybe he comes back to life in 2024, improves, kind of improves the strikeout rate, improves his contact rate, everything that he was kind of touted to be, which is someone who's not going to strike out as much and someone who's going to put the ball in play and get on base. That's something that he has not done since being traded over here to Washington, D.C. But with all that said, though, here's here's really what we have to get down to. And this is kind of something that may hit a little bit hard for a lot of Nats fans. This farm system as a whole, not just the blue chip guys who will be very good baseball players, but this farm system as a whole is a little bit of a house of cards. It is. Because the thing is, it is a very top-heavy system. But here's the thing, though. This farm system does have a lot of improvement. And there's a lot of room for improvement as well. 
I think when you account for guys like Dalen Lyle, who's just coming off a very good year one in the national system, improving from Fredericksburg all the way to Wilmington, looking good at really both destinations there. You have guys like Andrew Pinckney, another third round pick or a mid round pick from this last year's draft class. He seems to be like a very good prospect as well. Johan Di Morales as well, who is in this conversation, really kind of bulk up this farm system. You got guys like Elijah Green, who if he does make a second year turnaround here in his second full season down in the minor leagues, maybe he can kind of turn around and get some things going down in Fredericksburg and then have eyes back on him again. There's a lot of different scenarios. Also, Yarlene Susana, another big time kind of prospect in which who came back in that Juan Soto return. If he were to get his kind of crap together down in low A Fred, you never know. I think the big overlapping picture, though, with this Nationals farm system is that it is a top heavy system. But that's not to say that they can't develop other guys in this system. You're also going to have a first round pick, a top 10 pick. Entering your draft or entering your farm system sometime this summer. You're going to have another second round pick entering your farm system this summer. I also think there's a lot of guys who may not get all the recognition. You talk about Trey Lipscomb. We did a whole show on him at what it feels like every other week now. Trey Lipscomb is another guy in this fold who may not get the entire national recognition, but this is going to be an impact player, I believe, at some point in the big leagues, maybe sometime this summer. There are a lot of different scenarios in which this national scene, you can look at it and say, yeah, it is a little bit of a top-heavy system. But there are also a lot of lottery ticket guys. And if you're an everydayer out there, you know we talk about these lottery ticket prospects. The guys who have big ceilings who may not transpire to be what their exact ceiling is, but if they were to reach somewhere close to it, they're going to be an impact big leaguer. Now, here's the thing, though. With this Nationals kind of revamping their player development department from this last offseason, I think that's going to be a key thing here. Because this is what the Nationals have always kind of done poorly, in my opinion. It's never really been a lack of identifying talent. It's never been that. I think the Nationals have always found ways to get the best talent into their farm system. They always spend in free agency, not in free agency right now, but they spend in the draft. They don't really cheap out and get guys for lesser values. They've always gotten the best guy. That's always been their draft philosophy. And international scouting, when they go in for someone like a Christian Vaccaro, they go in for him. They get the best talent out there. They've always done that. It's never a pinpointing talent issue with this team. Where the issue has been, on the player development side. They have not been able to get the most out of their guys. And if you see it with the Padres... They are very good at developing players. They're very good at developing young talent. You look at their farm system now, it seems to already be replenished after that Juan Soto trade just in a short matter of time. The reason why that they are different than us is because they don't have a player development issue. They can get guys who are drafted in the sixth round. Someone who is an international signing bonus of maybe just a million dollars who may not be the top guy, but all of a sudden you get the most out of him. There are situations like that, like again, in San Diego, where teams like them, they can do that. The Nationals, they have not been able to do that in quite some time. So revamping the player development side, I think will also get kind of the most out of your blue chip lottery kind of prospects. Your blue chip guys, again, Dylan Cruz, James Wood, Brady House, I think those guys will be fine no matter what. But then you get to the Johan D. Morales, Robert Hassel, Elijah Green. Andrew Pinkney, Trey Lipscomb, Travis Sakura, all these different guys, that is where you can kind of see yourself, kind of separate yourself from the pack. That's where you see the Dodgers and what they do best. That's where you see the Braves, what they do best, the Rays, all these good organizations that have been doing this time after time after time. That is what the Nationals have to do. And really, what are the best things about those organizations? Number one, they do spend their money wisely. Number two, and in my opinion, this should probably be number one, they develop players. That is where this issue is. So with the Nationals, are they as good as we think? Is this farm system as good as we think? Tricky question. Number one, it is good. This is a good farm system. You've got good blue chip guys. If you have three of those guys, Brady House, Dylan Cruz, and James Wood, if you have three guys just right then and there develop into being an everyday baseball player, all-star kind of players, that's good enough for me. But also, it's not just the fact that you have to be good enough. 
you can get the most out of other guys. And I think that is what will separate the good farm systems from the great ones. The Nationals, they got a good one. But the player development side of things, they could turn this great or this good farm system into a great one. And that is when you see Trey Lipscomb develop. That is when you see Robert Hassel get back in form. That is when you see Elijah Green step back in form. Guys like that. Yohandi Morales come out of nowhere. You have Andrew Pinkney come out of nowhere. Pitchers and all these different things. Jake Irvin, another kind of out of nowhere prospect who was really impressive in his rookie season up in the big leagues. That is where you'll see some separation of the pack. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I would not be surprised because the player development side of things, it has been revamped. And again, let me reiterate, this is not a talent identification issue. It has always been a player development issue here in the nation's capital. I think that could change, though, with this new regime running the player development side. Thank you all for making Locked On Nats your first listen every single day as we are free and available wherever you get your podcast. And of course, check us out on YouTube. Wherever you get your podcast, just check us on YouTube or wherever you get your pods. Search Locked On Nationals there. Next, let's talk about C.J. Abrams, Bobby Witt Jr., top 10 pick. Back in the day, one of the best prospects in baseball over the last few years got his extension, and it was an 11 year extension, the highest Kansas City Royals contract that they have, the biggest Kansas City Royals contract that they have ever given out. And guys, that is Kansas City, Kansas City, Missouri, Washington, D.C. Come on, you smell what I'm cooking here? We'll talk about it. CJ Abrams, Bobby Witt Jr., what's going to happen? I'll tell you guys about that after we tell you about our friends over at FanDuel. Happy Super Bowl to all who celebrate from FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. And if you're like me, Super Bowl Sunday is all about scoring the best seat on the couch, grabbing your favorite football snacks, and placing some super bets. This is what I love on Super Bowl Sunday. I wake up, I have my coffee, and I immediately get my snacks. Slept on snack in the Super Bowl are those wiener dog things that you wrap up in a croissant roll they're the best but you know it's also the best betting on FanDuel and FanDuel has so many ways for you to end the season with a W or two or ten not only you can bet on who will win the Super Bowl 58 but FanDuel also has bets for which players will score a touchdown how many points will be scored and so much more if you just check it out new customers join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of five dollars or more wins just visit fanduel.com slash locked on to sign up that's fanduel.com slash locked on make every moment more with fanduel the official sports betting partner of the nfl thank you all for making locked on nationals your first listen every single day as we are free and available wherever you get your podcast and of course you know the news cj abrams you kind of smell what i'm cooking here Bobby Witt Jr. just signed an 11-year extension worth $289 million, could be up to the mid-350s at some point if he were to hit all his escalators, if he were to hit all the opt-ins with the Kansas City Royals. And listen, let's all gather around here for a second. CJ Abrams. If you believe in C.J. Abrams the way that we have kind of been pressing the way that we've been talking about this offseason, let's extend C.J. Abrams. What are we waiting for at this moment? What are the Nationals waiting for? Maybe C.J. Abrams is a little reluctant to do so. Maybe he is. But I don't believe that's the case. And I don't think he's going to be getting, I already know for a fact, he's not going to be getting what Bobby Witt Jr. just got. But here's the thing that will disappoint me the most. If it were to come out that the Nationals We're not even trying to extend C.J. Abrams because I'm telling you this right now. If C.J. Abrams has his big breakout season this year where he has maybe an 800 plus OPS, where he's hitting 20 home runs, where he's still 60 bags, you ain't extending C.J. Abrams. In fact, it's going to be very difficult to do that. I think the Nationals, if they were the smart franchise that I think that they are, I still do. Mike Rizzo's running the operation. I still believe in him. If you believe in that operation, you got to get on this fast. You have to jump on this bus and extend C.J. Abrams. And the reason why we say that is because we all know why. All the prospects that have walked out the doors here in D.C., all of them. Yes, a lot of these guys are Scott Boris clients. Luckily, C.J. Abrams, he's a Rock Nation guy. 
He's not a Scott Boris client. You can get this deal done. You can get this deal done. Now, here's the thing that may hurt just a little bit. C.J. Abrams, he doesn't have the ceiling of Bobby Witt Jr. Bobby Witt Jr. has got the power. He's got the speed combination of C.J. Abrams as well. And he's got the fielding potential over at shortstop. He's just a little bit better than C.J. Abrams in really about every aspect. But again, not all too much better. He's got much better power, and that's really just about it. Speed-wise, defensive-wise, they're pretty comparable in my opinion. But with C.J. Abrams and with the Nationals, this is what you got to do. This is the business that which you just have to simply be in. Make an offer to C.J. Abrams that he cannot refuse. He can't. You're going to be the franchise shortstop for the next 10 years. Wherever that contract may look like, at this point, maybe 10 years, 200 million, something like that, you could get something done with CJ this offseason. Is it a risky kind of offer to make? I'm sure it is. I don't even know how much money he could demand at this moment in time. But looking at it from this way, CJ Abrams, if you're going to be giving anyone a contract extension on this team right now, it's got to be CJ on the major league roster. You have to go with CJ Abrams. You can discuss Dylan Cruz, James Wood. Both those guys are Scott Boris clients. They're going to free agency in the next eight to nine years, wherever that could be. Those guys are out of the picture for now. But with CJ Abrams, you got your guy at one of the most important positions. You had that also with someone like Trey Turner. Unfortunately, we just kind of dropped the ball on that front and you never got to extend your franchise shortstop there. But now you've got C.J. Abrams, and it looks a lot like the Trey Turner experience from back in the day. This is going to be someone who can have that speed slash a little bit of power combination there. Someone who's going to be your franchise shortstop for years to come. This is what you've got. Don't make the same mistake twice, because if the Nationals were to make the same mistake twice and really kind of botch the negotiations, because here's the thing, I'm sure C.J. Abrams would probably sign an extension here when he may not want to sign an extension with the, with the learner ownership group kind of halfway out the door, halfway in the door? Maybe not. But here's the thing, you got to try. Because a team like the Kansas City Royals, the way that they have been spending this offseason, they're spending like they're going to win. And that team was terrible this last year. They were awful, in fact. They were terrible. How many times do I have to say it? They spent this offseason. They have a higher payroll than the Nationals do. And then you sign and extend your star for the next 11 years to stay in Kansas City. The Nationals got to do that. You have to. You cannot have smaller market teams have guys like Bobby Witt Jr. and extend them almost immediately. The Royals are giving out money this offseason. Like, they haven't spent money in decades, which they kind of haven't. But also the Nationals, they haven't really spent money like that either. And I think with this C.J. Abrams, if they were to get an extension done, it would be just the smartest move in the world. That is what smart organizations do. Looking at last offseason with Kibet Ruiz and the little small extension that you gave him, that is a win-win scenario for this Nationals team. You're not giving him much at all. He could be a 700 OPS hitter for the rest of time and an average defender. That contract will still be worth it. That is a win-win scenario. If he stinks, Whatever. But with C.J. Abrams and with kind of the rocket ship that I think he could be on, potentially being an all-star someday, potentially kind of taking the league, the National League by storm, being a very good shortstop, a franchise caliber shortstop that's going to be on your signs over at Nationals Park walking down Half Street. He's going to be having his face plastered in an alien logo, which he wears his necklace for. All those things. You want this guy for your team and for your future moving forward. That is an important factor of this rebuilding process. Let's kind of get back into the Kansas City part of this. The Royals, they're doing this. Why can't the Nationals, a big market team, a top 10 market in all of baseball? What is holding us back? Nothing. It's not the money flow. The Royals, what have they done? They haven't won anything since they won the World Series back in 2015. That's a long time ago. They haven't been back to the postseason since hell. 2015, 2016. It's been a long journey for those Kansas City Royals teams. And now with the Nationals, you're kind of in that market as well, which you haven't made the postseason since 2019 when you won that World Series. But you just got to be a little bit better. You got to be a little bit better. You got to think ahead. And I think if the Nationals were thinking ahead, this is what it is. 
You extend CJ Abrams. You show the fan base. We're back in this thing next off season. Get ready. We're going to spend. We're going to put a winner up on that on half street there for nationals fans. It'll be interesting, but start the movement. Now extend CJ Abrams. Thank you all for making locked on Nats. Your first listen every single day as we are free and available wherever you get your podcast. And of course, Check us out over on Twitter at Ryan Clary 11 as well as the show page at LO underscore nationals. And while you're at it, search on YouTube, Locked On Nationals, hit that notification bell, and as well as the subscriber button. I'd greatly appreciate that if you did. And of course, Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel on YouTube. And now you can also find it on Amazon Fire TV. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find the Locked On Sports Today channel now on Amazon Fire TV and as well as YouTube. So next, the Nats. Pitchers and catchers are reporting in the next few days here. You got to get a starting pitcher. Let's talk about that after this. And now we get back into it as the Nationals so desperately need, in my opinion, just some starting pitcher in the door. Looking at it from this way, here's what the rotation will look like on opening day. There's going to be some movement with it, obviously, but here's the thing. Number one, Josiah Gray. Number two, Mackenzie Gore. Number three, Patrick Corbin. Number four, Trevor Williams. Number five, Jake Irvin. That is what your rotation is going to look like, at least to start the year. Jackson Rutledge can make his way in there eventually. Maybe someone else makes their way back into the bullpen. There's a lot of different moves in which the Nationals could make. Cade Cavalli is going to be in the picture at some point. A lot of different scenarios will be able to happen. But the Nationals, let's face it. Patrick Corbin, Trevor Williams, two of the worst starting pitchers in the National League. Simple. Those two guys right then and there, Patrick Corbin, you're spending a lot of money for his last year in D.C. And again, a Nationals legend. I understand that. Maybe you want to keep him in the rotation. I don't understand it, but I can deal with it. Trevor Williams, though, this is where you have to have a little bit of foresight. You got to be able to tell that this guy not only is a good pitcher, but has a role in which he has been successful in, being that fireman. Have Trevor Williams go back into the bullpen. Have him be a guy who maybe is an opener and goes three innings. Maybe come in in a situation where the Nationals and the starting pitcher gets rocked around. He can come in and eat a few innings out of the bullpen. Have him be that guy. He is good in that role. If you want to win games, you put guys in the best situation possible in order to succeed. That is what you should do with Trevor Williams. The Nationals just simply have not been able to do that, have not been able to figure that out so far. Because you've got situations in which there's a little bit of a logjam brewing with the national starting rotation. You're already kind of wasting it right now with Patrick Corbin, who's making $35 million this year. You're already wasting it with Trevor Williams. Move one of those guys back there. And if it was to move, it was my decision to move any of those guys, it's going to be Trevor Williams for all the reasons that we just listed. And which guys would kind of go in there and fill those holes? Well, there's going to be injuries at some point to this rotation. You got to face with that, obviously, here. But Cade Cavalli, he's going to be the one to get the green light up into the rotation. Jackson Rutledge will probably be the odd man out. I wouldn't be surprised to see him early on in the season, up into the maybe into the bullpen or in the rotation. But you got to make room for guys like Cade Cavalli. And Trevor Williams, he's going to be the first odd man out. And if you were to go all in on this young, vibrant pitching staff, then you should probably do that as well. Have Patrick Corbin back into the bullpen, have him eat those innings because. Really, what is the use of having him go out there every five days if you're going to be getting five innings pitch and four earned runs with a couple of home runs given up? What's the point of that anymore? What is it? Especially when you have guys like Jackson Rutledge who can come up and get some meaningful innings. He showed a little bit of promise last year. He wasn't all too bad. He showed some improvement over the last two years down in the minors. Also, Jake Irvin. I really like Jake Irvin. I think Jake Irvin should automatically be in the starting rotation moving forward. I also like Cade Cavalli and his potential. You've got young guys in which you can kind of roll with this year. Josiah Gray, Mackenzie Gore, Jake Irvin, Cade Cavalli, and Jackson Rutledge. 
that would be a dream starting rotation there. If you want to get a six guy in there to really stretch out all the young guys, because you do have guys coming off injuries, like, well, Mackenzie Gore is not coming off any injuries from this year, but he has been injured in the past. You've also got guys like Cade Cavalli coming off Tommy John surgery. You could have him and kind of give him that six day of rest with Patrick Corbin doing a six man rotation. You got Trevor Williams, who's been injured in the past as well. You've got all the different guys. A lot of pitchers have injuries in the past. Simple as that. So if the Nationals make some room for the young guys, that is what I'm a little bit concerned about. But also with that said, pursue a veteran starting pitcher. Get them in the door some way, somehow. You just need a little bit of help in that department because you know it's not going to be all sunshine and rainbows for a young starting rotation staff this year. It's not. Someone's going to get hurt. Someone will not be as good as we thought. You're going to want to move some things around. So having a veteran presence like a Trevor Williams, except hopefully a little bit better, is going to be beneficial to this team moving forward. We'll see if the Nationals go down that route yet again. Today was a good show. Good show. Good vibes. We've got baseball right around the corner here, Nationals fans. We cannot wait here. We will be your number one daily coverage of this team moving forward. You will not want to miss a thing. Go Nationals. It'll be fun. Offseason is coming to an end. Pitchers and catchers are coming soon right around the corner. Catch you guys on the flip side. Have a good one.